we did, um, we looked largely at the uh, biology, so there was not a lot of mathematics. We did, uh, you know, a couple derivations. No, that's not true. We did do two bona fide derivations. Uh, but let me take you through just quickly what we did yesterday. So we're talking about cell division. This is uh, DNA, the chromosome. It gets replicated, then the cell divides. We looked at uh, some empirical <coughs> relations, so basically that uh, what is sometimes called the fundamental uh, results of uh, bacterial physiology. These these two back-to-back -back papers by uh, Mola's group in 1958. So in steady state, and this is now balanced exponential growth, where you keep the cells in in exponential growth for 10 generations before you take any measurements. We or they found that the RNA per cell increased basically exponentially with the doubling rate um, at a higher rate than the mass per cell, which was, again, at a higher rate than the DNA per cell. They also did shift experiments, and you can rationalize the slope of these lines, at least for the mass per cell and the DNA per cell, by looking at the shift times and the kinetics. So if you go from a poor medium to a rich medium, the time it takes for each of these uh, constituents, if you like, the mass, the DNA and then the cell number to catch up to the new rate of division uh, will give you the slopes of these lines on a log linear plot, which is surprising, uh, but nonetheless we saw yesterday was a self-consistency check, if you like. And it comes from the fact that these, these shifts are so abrupt. They're basically piecewise linear on a, on a log scale. Um, the RNA per cell, on the other hand, we rationalized in a different way. We rationalized it uh, looking at the mechanics, what's really going on here. And that was something to do with uh, the neidhart magasanic paper, where we saw that the rate of protein production, by their assumption, was proportional to the number of ribosomes, which then again was proportional to the RNA content in the cell. And that's what gave you this straight line relationship at fast enough growth rates. With the interpretation that the slope of this line is inversely related to this uh, translation rate, the number of amino acids that you make per second per ribosome. Okay, so this is nice. It gives you an idea, a mechanistic explanation for this for this increase in the RNA to protein ratio, and then possibly this increased slope in the RNA per cell. This connection between the slopes of these lines and these kinetic times is less clear. And so, from about 1958 on, there was a search for for some more detailed or mechanistic explanation for where these times come from and what was underlying the regulation of this switching to the new growth rates. All right, so that's what we'll talk about today. And it will probably take us till tomorrow as well because it's, a, it's an incredibly, um, it's an incredible experiment. <laughs> so it takes some unpacking. All right, but let me pause here. Are there any questions about what we did uh, last lecture? No, I mean last day, so the last two lectures. Is that okay? All right, and so I posted my, my, my notes on a, a link accessible from my home webpage. So if you have any trouble, um, try that out. Otherwise, let me know, and I can point you in the direction of the lecture notes and the course notes. Okay. All right. Okay, so one of the big problems here uh, with, with trying to infer mechanism, particularly at the level of single cells, is that all of these results are at, uh, done on, say, 10 to the 9 cells, or 10 to the 8 cells, was a huge population. And so we're looking at population averaged um, uh, results. And so the first question that we want to ask today, which will then lead us into uh, resolving this issue later this lecture, or maybe tomorrow's lecture, is when I say population averaged, precisely what uh, you know, probability density am I using to average? I mean, what does the for example, age distribution of these cells look like in a population. Okay, and so that's what we'll talk about today. Um, and this is leading towards something called the Helmstetter-Cooper experiments, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll title this more dramatically as a search for synchrony. And by that, I mean that, that in the 1950s, the technology wasn't yet developed to observe single cells in real time. Uh, the technology, no, no, G, 
not yet developed to uh, observe single cells. And, and so the, 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 the genius of the biologists at this time was, it, well, maybe we don't need to observe a single cell carefully. What if we could synchronize a population of 10 to the 8 cells? Then we wouldn't have to worry about measurement noise or anything like that. We would have this large population, but they would be synchronized. It would be acting as though they were a single cell. So the idea at the time was... Can we synchronize a uh, population of ten to the nine, say, or ten to the, you know, ten to the eight cells? That would be effectively a large population of single cells, if you like, would <laughs> be acting like. an observable single cell. Does everybody uh, understand the reasoning here? So if this, if this population is synchronized, everything in the population is doing the same thing at the same time. It's very much like just taking repeated measurements of a single cell. It's like an ergodic theorem, if you like. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. How do you know that they're synchronized without, so without being looking? How can I say that? Uh, so one way you could do it is you could look and see if they all divide at the same time. That's, that's just like, um, well, that's only one, one criteria for calling them. Okay. You can only say they're synchronized in terms of their division. Sure, okay, yeah, that's true. So you would have to, you would have to come up with a criterion for what you mean by synchrony. And it... It will turn out that the criterion that we'll have is this division. So synchrony and age, they're the same age. Yeah? Does that make sense? But then again, there would be an implicit assumption that the cell cycle within each cell is somehow the same. If you're at the same age, you're undergoing the same. <coughs> and for a eukaryotic cell, you know, that would be problematic. For bi bacteria, it's not so bad. Okay, does everybody, is that okay? Any questions about this, this search? And so you can imagine maybe some, some tricks that you might try. One trick is that people tried temperature shifts. So you would make them hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, in the hopes that they, they, would, have, they would basically convulse into some uh, sort of stasis, and then you would grow them normally, and everybody would relax at the same time. Another trick was, was nutrient shift. And in fact, these experiments were designed to synchronize, and they did not. <laughs> Neither do temperature shifts. None of these things synchronize cells. And the reason that they don't synchronize cells is because the age is distributed through the population. Some cells are older and some cells are younger. And if you want to synchronize, that means you need to narrow that distribution to a delta function. And playing with temperature, playing with shifts, all it does is move that distribution around. It doesn't narrow it in any reasonable sense. Okay, and so what I want to talk about first is, what is this distribution that I keep indicating with my hands? And then second of all, how can we resolve this, uh, or how did they resolve this? Okay, now, I'll maybe give you a little foreshadowing, which is that it turns out to be more or less impossible to uh, synchronize bacteria. But what you can do is sample, in a very clever way, sample strips from the population distribution in time, which serves the same purpose. And that, that, that I mean, wasn't really designed to make sense at this point, but that's where we're headed. All right. So then first, uh, what is the, is the uh, distribution of uh, ages in the population? What I mean by that is uh, how close are some cells to dividing, or how close are cells to dividing, what's the distribution of that uh, the, the, that age, if you like. So by age, I mean 
H here, I'm going to denote by A, and it's anything between 0 and tau, where this is the doubling time, or division time. And so you can have newborn cells, which have age 0 by definition, and then you can have very old cells, according to their life cycle, which would be tau minus epsilon. Right. And so we're, we're going to work this out, what this age distribution is. But I, I, just intuitively, yeah, Mateo. And so uh, in a population, uh, tau will also be a random variable. Right? Yeah. It will be also different from, uh, so are you uh, considering age uh, relative uh, to, uh, say, point 0.8 of uh, your division time or, uh, or, or absolute uh, in this, in this case, uh, I'm not. And so it could be that A, A is actually going to go from 0 to infinity. In, in, I, but we're going to find that it's compactly supported if I make the assumption that tau is a delta function. But we don't need that. So in the derivation, I'm going to leave the distribution of doubling times or division times as a distribution. And then when we get to the end and we want to normalize the distribution, that's when we're going to put in, in some additional assumptions just to make it a little bit easier. But for now, I, I mean this conceptually. You're right. It, it, you're free to go further, and some will. Is that okay with today? Yeah. All right. It's like uh, even if you have a larger range, yeah. if you modulo operation, modulo tau, right? So yeah, yeah. Like, like uh, it can be in the second. Uh, so there's a one mother that yeah. It divides. Yeah. But then again, it can divide again. But uh, so. Oh, it ceases to be the mother at that point. No, no, no. That, I mean, it's not. It's not semantic. It means. I mean that it, it really does reset. Yeah. So the two that come off at the end go back to the beginning. So it's more like a modulo tau. I mean, it's like uh, in, the, in terms of... The uh, yeah, I mean, you recycle yeah. cells back again. You're right. Um, and Mateo's point is that it's not a hard wall. I, I put it up here as you know, just to... Uh, so, you, so you have a sense of what I mean by age. But think of this tau as a sort of a fuzzy ending to their, to their uh, doubling cycle. Or if you like, you can think of it as a delta distributed. Everybody divides exactly 40 minutes after birth. That's conceptually fine as well. Um, but is that, is that okay? So this modularity is important, and we'll come back to it in one second. But you had a question? No? That was it? Okay, now my question is, given this modularity that he suggested, <coughs> what can you tell me qualitatively about this population distribution? Anything? Uniform. Uniform, okay. Can it be uniform? <laughs> okay, Gaussian and uniform are perfectly legitimate knee-jerk uh, suggestions, which is, of course, as a physicist, that's what you would, I mean, that's what I would say. Right? If it's not uniform, <laughs> it's either Poisson or Gaussian, and that's totally legitimate. But there's something that we know about this, this uh, process that's, if you like, unique to this system, which is exactly what you were saying. Right? That mothers become two daughters. What does that imply about the population distribution? Pardon me? It's, it's sort of power law, but then, but then maybe I'm not, I'm not framing it well. Do you expect more young cells or more old cells? <coughs> more young cells. More young cells. And how many more? Twice as many. There's always twice as many young cells in your population as there are old cells. Because all the time, the old cells are having, they're dividing into two. Which is very weird. I mean, now you can rationalize it backwards. But it's odd that no matter what distribution you have for these doubling times or whatever it is, you are going to have twice as many young cells as you, are, uh, as you have old cells. And what we'll do is, is, is uh, analytically derive the what this distribution needs to be, and you'll see that that is indeed true. But just qualitatively, I hope it makes sense that because these cells grow, 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 then divide and sort of recycle again, you're always dumping in from the, from the end of the distribution, you're dumping back in again to the front twice as many. So it's like a, a periodic boundary condition with amplification, if you like. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah? All right. And so we know, we know qualitatively...
there will be be twice as many newborn cells as there are cells about to divide. Divide. But what precisely precisely is the distribution? Okay. And uh, and so let me introduce some notation, and then let's let's uh, manipulate this distribution until we can um, solve for it. <coughs> so I'll, I'll give you a sort of a, what would you call it a, a synopsis of what we're about to do. I'm going to define these probability distributions both for the division time and for the age distribution, and then we're going to use properties of of statistical distributions, namely that you can look at cumulative probabilities, to end up with a difference equation for that distribution, which is going to be horrible. But then we can use Taylor series to turn that into a differential equation, which we can solve lickety-split. And once we have that, well, of course, then normalization becomes an issue. And so we'll normalize after making a, uh, an assumption about this distribution for these doubling times. It's not necessary, but for us, it serves, uh, it's fine. For what we're going to use this, this distribution for, it'll be sufficient. Okay, so let me first define what I mean by these distributions, or what notation I'm going to use, and then let's talk about it. So, um, so the cell age distribution, or the age distribution is uh, denoted by, um, well, I will denote it by phi A. And what I mean is that it's a continuous distribution which represents a probability that a bacterium uh, has aged between uh, A and A plus DA, or however you want to do this, you know, A minus DA over 2, however in some interval of width dA. Yeah, more that mothers are dumping, every time they divide, they dump in two newborns. So the instant that they divide... But why, why, why are you calling them able to divide? They are as able to divide as the newborn ones. Uh, cells about to divide. Oh, I mean at the threshold of division. Their age is tau. Sorry, do you, is that not clear? So cells about to divide, i.e. their age is about tau. So A... A approximately equal to tau is what I mean. I mean, they're, they're uh, at the end of their career as a single cell. Is that better? No? Is it the about, or is it the what do I mean? Okay, what do we talk about? Okay, is this okay, this uh, distribution, what I mean by this? Okay, let me talk then about the distribution for the doubling times. Um... So also, we have distribution for the doubling times, which I'm going to call F tau. Um, I'm going to call that F tau, F lowercase tau where here I mean that F is a uh, continuous probability distribution that denotes the probability the, a, a bacterium divides at age 
A somewhere between tau and tau plus d tau. All right. Let me pause though. So these are going to be the two, the uh, two sort of things that we're going to be playing with. This one we're going to be, we're going to assume it's a given. This is our input, if you like, and we want to find this output. So we need to find an equation that's going to transform our given distribution of doubling times to some probability of ages, if that makes sense, I hope. Is that sensible? All right, let's take a look. So I'm going to move this down so that I can use the board, but hopefully A between tau and tau plus D tau. All right, so the first step is going to be to look at the cumulative distribution. Um, of this uh, doubling time. So I'm going to integrate it from some time up to infinity. I'll do that in one moment. But one thing that I want to call your attention to is that I'm, I'm going to be thinking of this as a steady state distribution. And so there'll be no time dependence in this, this distribution for now. Well, forever in this course, but... <laughs> All right, so this guy's steady state. All right, now let's look at the, uh, the uh, cumulative distribution. So we'll introduce cumulative uh, density. This is going to be called uh, F greater than, which is, a, a, uh, is the fraction of cells with doubling time uh, greater than tau. Okay. <clears throat> More like complementary Pardon me? Okay, so you can think of it as the complement of the Sure. Uh, I could call it A, cumulative density, then, rather than B. Uh, and so, by definition, we'll have this. Uh, F of tau, D tau. Well, let me, put, let me put primes here, sorry. There we go. All right, and so this is, this is really the, the extent of the probability theory that we need. And now what we're going to do is manipulate this and try, oh, sorry, and try to, uh, to express a certain fraction in a second in two different ways, and that'll give us our difference equation. But let me pause. Is the notation comfortable for everybody? Anyone have any questions about notation? Yeah. Yeah. This guy? Yeah, we have two different probabilities. The probability yeah. of the age and the mm -hmm. probability of um, bacteria age. So it's like um, a whole uh, duration. Like, for example, a, people, a person can live 100 years, mm -hmm. but then you're calculating how many, uh, the probability of having age between, for example, 5 and um, 10. Exactly, exactly. But, but how can you calculate the, the mean division? The, the, uh, the yeah, so this is an input. We either need to measure this or just guess what it might be. And here, a Gaussian distribution would be maybe a sensible guess or something like this. Yeah, you would have to either have a guess or some empirical uh, reason for your choice. You might even try a uniform between two bounds. But the, but the idea here is that given this distribution, we want to chug it through the biology to get this distribution. But you can also change that distribution with the nutrition and with the <coughs> environment. And if you change it slightly, you can change the, the light, make it um, in a distribution you want. Yeah, possibly. I mean, within reason. 
But here what we're thinking of is steady state at a single growth rate, and that'll be important. If you want to do shifts and things like that, then it's going to be, you'll need to modify this derivation. But you should have enough tools to do that if you wanted to. It's okay? All right, let's take a look. All right, so suppose that uh, we have a bacterium that reaches age A. All right, so then what is the probability that it will reach reach age A plus T without dividing. All right. And this is kind of one of those I mean, it's a classic uh, assignment question in, in probability and statistics, but let's work through it. So is that comfortable? So we've got them. We know that we're at age A, whatever that age might be. We have some finite interval, A plus T, and I haven't said what, you know, T is just some finite non-zero number. Uh, and we want to know what's the probability of getting that far without dividing. All right. Okay, so here my delta t is just t. So you can think of this as delta t if you want. Is that okay? No? <laughs> okay, all right. So, so let's look at it. This is age A. This is age T. This is age infinity. <laughs> all right, and so this... If we go like this, then F greater than A is the uh, fraction, fraction with uh, doubling time uh, greater than A. By definition, that makes sense, right? And in this one, This will be F greater than A plus T, which is the fraction with doubling time uh, greater than tau, or sorry, greater than A plus T. If that makes sense. Is that right? That's with, by definition? Okay, now we want the fraction. So let me write it like this. So given the bacterium reaches age A, probability Uh, no division occurs in this interval a to a plus t is going to be equal to uh, what? And you can either tell me directly or you can, we can argue uh, pictorially and you can tell me what element of this picture I'm, I'm talking about. Can you say one more time? One, one minus one minus one minus one minus Okay, I agree. So, so what is this fraction? This is th this fraction is 
probability that no division occurs between 0 and a plus t. Is that true? So the, the point here is that, that we've, got, we've got only this rectangle to worry about. We've said because it's a conditional probability, we're at A. All this stuff, with probability 1, we've reached AJ. OK, and so this dark rectangle is going to be the fraction with doubling time between A and A plus T. Okay, exactly. Can I, can, can I pause for one second? I mean, I'll just pause, take a look at that, and tell me if you believe it. All right, now, given that rectangle, What's the, what's this fraction of that rectangle? Of course, it's problematic because one of the sides of the rectangle is infinitely far away. But, you know, just, you can just bend, bend yourself there. Yeah? Sorry, I can't understand the difference between the double time and the division. The doubling time and the division time, same thing. Sorry. Did I? So a doubling time is the division time. They're synonymous. Okay, same. Same, yeah. So they divide. The numbers double. All right, so I want the light part of this. I want to know what fraction of that rectangle is not hatched, is not, does not have lines on it. Yeah, that's true. That, that's true that these, this might, I mean, this is, this is optimistic, right? That it probably starts to be 1 after that. But, the, but it still stands, if t is sort of small enough, then, then you would think that there is a, an appreciable fraction that is here and an appreciable fraction that's here. I mean, it doesn't really matter for us if it's appreciable or not. Just uh, abstractly, what would be the fraction of this rectangle? Okay, so it's not it's not this, but that was a, that was a good guess. That would be if a is zero. So I'm going to write it. There are a couple of suggestions up here, but it's the ratio of this to this. Because what we're interested in is this piece. We want to know the relative area of that piece relative to the whole rectangle. Let me write it up, and then you tell me if you believe it. So this is going to be f greater than a plus t divided by f greater than a. And that's going to be the area of the part of the rectangle that's got an x through it. OK, so two questions. One, does that match your intuition for what these functions are representing? And two, does everybody see what I'm, I'm trying to calculate? Anybody Nazi? Anybody want to want to back up a bit? Is that okay? I guess maybe not okay. Okay is not the word. Is that does that seem reasonable? Yeah. All right. Okay. So here, what I'm asking is, given that you start here, what's the probability that you make it here rather than dividing here? Okay, and the way that we do that is we'll ask what the probability is for this whole rectangle and then look at the probability that you missed the hatched part of it. And undoubtedly, you can manipulate that in different ways. right? But what I want to do is look at it as, as this fraction because I want to express it then in terms of this age distribution in a moment. All right, so if we have that, let's, let's start fiddling with it. So, uh, 
So that's, suppose we start with uh, N bacteria. with age uh, zero. So we have a perfectly synchronized uh, initial population. Now I want to ask how we can rewrite that, that uh, fraction in terms of this exponentially growing population. So the number of bacteria age A, A plus DA will be All right, so if I start with N bacteria at age zero, and then I have this, this distribution, what's, what's the, uh, I shouldn't have put them at age zero, sorry. Uh, start with N bacteria. Suppose we have N bacteria. <coughs> then what's the number of bacteria that have an age between A and A, A plus DA? Given that we have a probability distribution for the age. Yes, so we'll get N multiplied by phi A D A. Does that make sense? So this is at this instant right now. Now suppose we wait a time t, what's going to happen? So now, so the number, let me write one more thing and let's talk about it. So the number undivided at A plus T is going to be this. So this will be number undivided at age A plus T will now be what? So suppose I have that many bacteria and if that fraction, I can multiply the two. And so I'll get, let me write this up and then let's talk about it. By A D A times this fraction, I promise you we're getting somewhere. <laughs> we're right at the threshold of getting somewhere. All right. Okay, so, so far so good. This is the number that are at this age. So that's the number that are here. And then we have this fraction that makes it for a finite step delta t, or t in this case. So far so good. So the, does this match then with your intuition for what these functions mean? It's OK? OK. All right. Now here's where the biology comes in. So over this interval, A, A plus T, the population increases to, all right, so suppose I'm, I'm imagining these as exponentially growing cells in steady state. What's going to happen over in finite interval or well, non-zero interval T? What will the population uh, increase to?
I don't know if I framed that right. Did that? Did I give you enough to go on? What's that? Sorry. Okay. So we have n cells right now. These cells are in balanced exponential growth. We wait to this time. So at time a, if you like, so t is equal to zero. We have n cells. At time t is equal to t, we have how many cells? After a period t has e e elapsed, what's the population? So, so sorry. So, so t is a finite amount of time. What's lurking in behind here is that we're in balanced exponential growth. So, what can you tell me about this population? Think of n as being so large that our population is continuous. I feel like I'm not giving, giving you enough information. I'm going to write it up, and you tell me if this is true. Exactly. Wait, maybe that's what you were saying. Were you using a base 2? So you were saying 2 to the doubling rate times t? Is that what you're saying? Because this is also the same thing as n 2 t divided by some doubling rate. Or t times mu, some average doubling rate. What's that? Yeah, we need to. We're eventually going to get F back again. Oh, I see. Okay, I think we should pause and kind of step through this. Okay, so your, your cells are growing exponentially, in balanced exponential growth. We have this idea that we have a distribution for their ages. We don't know what that is. We have a distribution for their doubling times. We also don't really know what that is. But empirically, we do know that the population itself is growing exponentially. All right? And so then the question is, given that I know this is true, so this is going to be my empirical input or constraint that I need to satisfy, and given that I have some unknown function for the doubling times and for the uh, cell age, what can I do with it? And how can I find this from this and this, All right? But this is an empirical constraint that we have to deal with. The cells are doubling exponentially, obviously, irrespective of, of, I mean, if we were free to choose any distribution of doubling times imaginable, probably we could, no, we couldn't. We can't break that. <laughs> All right? We don't know what the distribution of doubling times is precisely, but we do know that the cells are growing exponentially. Is that, does everybody, is that okay? Do you agree that this, that, that this n over this interval will have to increase exponentially? Okay, okay. So then if we want to look at, um, let me go one more step and then let's talk about it. So then the fraction of undivided cells is the following. It will be then fraction undivided uh, at a plus t will be this big mess. And then let's talk about it. Uh, phi a f greater than a plus t f greater than a T A divided by N E lambda T. All right, so this is the number that are undivided at A plus T, but this is the total population size at time A plus T. And so the fraction is, the div is dividing both of these. And so if I carry one more step, I will get, let me do it here, I will get Um, N by A, F greater than A plus T, F greater than A, D, A. 
Oh wait, phi a where the n disappears. Phi boop boo e minus t. Alright. Okay, but then I want to express this as a fraction. I'm assuming all of these cells are independent, so this is also a probability. What probability is it? Which is the same as, maybe it's best if I write it up here, i.e. the probability that a cell has age A plus T to A plus T plus D. Okay. okay. All right, so let's pause. Because we're at the threshold now of actually being able to derive a, uh, an equation for that phi, irrespective of what the distribution of doubling time is. <coughs> okay, so let's go back to this guy. Is that one? Let's go way back. Is this one all right? Okay, and then this empirical constraint that our cells are increasing exponentially. All right, and we have a fraction of undivided is going to be that number divided by this total population. And then we tidy it up a bit. The n's cancel. Uh, this exponential I'm putting in the numerator. But then I look at this. This is the fraction that are undivided at a plus t. So then that tells me that this is a probability that a cell has an age A plus T and A plus T plus DA. Is that okay? And now my question to you is, is there another way to write that? Yeah, he, you're exactly right. So, in terms of phi, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Phi a plus d, i.e., phi a plus t d a. And so, this, where we've advanced the probability distribution ahead by a finite increment, is equal to this. And that gives us our difference equation. So let me leave that up, and then let's, let me rewrite it over here. Or, and ba -ba -ba -bum, phi at a plus t, and I'll pause here, and then we can talk about it, uh, equals phi a f greater than a plus T over greater than A, E minus lambda T. And so the, the problem then becomes, you give me a distribution of doubling times, and you all obviously also need to tell me the growth rate of the population. Those are my inputs, and then it's incumbent upon me to solve this difference equation for phi. Right, it's subject, of course, to normalization, things like that. And it's horrible. You don't want to solve this thing. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about it and make sure that it's okay. And then what we'll do is take a Taylor series for small t and solve the differential equation. And then what I ask you to do as an exercise in, in, at the end of those lecture notes is prove that the distribution you get from the Taylor series also satisfies the difference equation. But for now, let's just take the, the Taylor series. But... Before I do that, is this equivalence uh, comfortable? Anybody have any questions about this equivalence? And so I wouldn't expect you to reproduce this argument. It's far too many steps for a person to keep in their head. So don't worry about memorizing this. It's more important to me that you can, you can see that it's baby step, baby step, baby step, baby step gives you what crazy solution in the end. Right? And I'm actually even more interested that you see the distribution later, even qualitatively. But I want to take you through the calculation once so that if you felt like it in future, you could go through it without any troubles or with a minimal amount of, of labor. All right, so that said, 
Is this, is this equivalence comfortable? All right. Okay. And so then we have this difference equation. How do we solve it? So how do we solve this? Hard. So we will uh, use a perturbation expansion. So we will use a, a Taylor series for t very small. Okay. And so maybe we'll do that. Uh, we'll take a break for maybe five, ten minutes or something, and we'll come back and solve this guy. But before we go, any questions before you go? All right, they might develop. So, uh, yeah, I'll see you in a bit. Oh, I forgot to hand this out again. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. In my give you before, which is this Bayes theorem. <coughs> okay, and that's uh, that. That's his derivation. Uh, and so, just to remind you, so I'm going back to the to the rectangle that I had. Which I think was not so great, maybe. So this is f greater than uh, a plus t, and then I had this guy, which is f greater than a. All right. So the and what we were looking for was again the probability. So given given the age. H A. What is the probability? No division uh, between A and A plus T. I.e., it's a survival probability that you reach the age A plus T. Okay, and so just to remind you, this is Bayes' theorem. We've got this conditional probability is expressible as a joint divided by the uh, the initial probability, if you like, and so. In terms of what we're talking about, we're looking for the conditional probability that given that the doubling time is greater than my present age, what is the probability that the doubling time is also greater than my age plus t? Right, so this conditional probability is precisely what we're after. Is that clear? Clearer, I hope, probably than this, this rectangle. But then we can express that as this joint probability that the doubling time is bigger than a plus t and the doubling time is bigger than a divided by the probability that the doubling time is bigger than a. So far, so good? Let me pause. So far, so good? All right, now his, his lovely insight is it this is a redundant uh, restriction that if the doubling time is greater than a plus t, t is non-zero and positive, then this is automatically true. It's redundant. Right? The first condition implies the second. And so then you end up with this probability that the doubling time is greater than my h plus t divided by the probability that the doubling time is greater than my h. But then that's just expressible in terms of a cumulative function. F greater than A plus T divided by F greater than A. And so the, that rectangle that I showed earlier was uh, a misguided attempt at, at circumventing Bayes' theorem. Is that okay? I hope that's better. Is that... Or, I mean, for those for whom this, the rectangle was not good, <laughs> hopefully this it brings us all together. Does it? Good. Okay. So that's the new way that I will teach this. Thanks. <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's go to the Taylor series. I'll leave that up if you, if you want, and then we'll come back to it. All right. Where's the jock here? Okay, and so, so if we take this, use a Taylor series with uh, t going to zero, then we can re-express these finite increments as infinitesimal changes 
So we'll, we'll tailor expand this. We'll tailor expand this. We'll also tailor expand this. Okay, and so we have that f greater than a plus t, and we have phi a plus t, and we have e negative lambda t. Only here am I going to keep the order symbol, so I'm only going to take it up to first order, and then I'm going to throw out all the, the order t squared stuff. Okay, so what I end up with is f greater than a plus t f prime greater than a, uh, phi a plus t phi prime of a, and then here I get 1 minus lambda t. And all of these are plus some order t squared uh, terms. Okay, and I'm going to truncate here and, and ignore the rest. Is that okay? Everybody's okay with this Taylor series? So the idea is that I want to get rid of this finite inc increment. All right, and so now if I plug that into here, what do I get? The first step is a mess, but then with a little bit of algebraic manipulation, we can, we can um, pull it together. Maybe I'll pass this around. I always forget to pass this around. <laughs> All right, so then if we put this into our difference equation, it becomes this. We'll end up with phi prime of a over phi of a is equal to f greater than a prime f greater than a minus lambda. Okay, and so the t's cancel, which is nice. And we get this ratio of derivatives over their functions. And so this immediately suggests to us that we start using natural logarithms. Uh, the next step is less obvious, but you, you'll be able to see in retrospect that it's okay. So let me write that up and then let's talk about it. This is dA times the natural logarithm of phi of A is equal to d by dA, the natural logarithm of, and normally we would just be looking at the natural logarithm of this guy, but that lambda is going to give us a little bit of trouble except that we can group everybody together. E negative lambda A. All right. And so if I've done everything correctly, I think that that will give you the same expression. Yeah, we're good. All right. And so now what we have is a separable differential equation. Before, it didn't look like it. It looked horrible. I guess you could see that it was a little bit separable, but anyway, here is a better form for it. And so we can integrate. Let me pause, though. Um, from here to here via this is, is, I hope, okay. Any questions, though? <coughs> it's okay. All right. So from here to here, okay. At least in retrospect. I mean, I don't think any sane person would rewrite this like this without knowing what the answer was. All right. And now if we integrate, what do we have, 1, 2, 12, yeah, all right. So if we integrate, we'll get phi of A is equal to some normalization constant, which we don't know yet, E negative lambda A, F greater than A. which we can now rewrite in terms of our, our uh, distribution for doubling times. So now we have phi 0, which is this normalization constant, and I'll come to that in a second, times this integral from a to infinity of f of tau prime, d tau prime. All right. And that, and that in, in, in principle, is our distribution for ages which is contingent or, or relies upon this assumption that my population is growing exponentially and is in some balanced state of growth. All right, and so we haven't said anything about f yet, this distribution of doubling times, nor have I said anything about the normalization condition. But we'll come to that. So are there any questions about the solution of this differential equation first off? 
Does this seem reasonable? All right, even without looking at a particular value of this um, um, distribution function or this normalization, qualitatively, can you say anything? Uh, you know, even without a, uh, an explicit, bless you, uh, F of tau. What can you say about this term and this term as A gets uh, larger? So phi at zero is newborn cells. And now as a function of A, what can you say about the remaining two terms? You got it. Yeah, they're monotonically decreasing. The exponential, I think, is, is okay. This guy's monotonically decreasing with A. This guy is too, though. It doesn't matter what this probability distribution is. This 1 minus accumulative is always going to be monotonically decreasing. And so we know that this guy is as big as the distribution gets. There are always more newborn cells. It doesn't matter what your distribution is. Okay. Um, phi zero is always the max. Because E negative lambda A and this integral are monotone decreasing. So now it, this comes from a derivation by Powell from 1957, and he goes through great pains to derive the normalization condition uh, for arbitrary f. But we don't need to do that. <laughs> I mean, if you're interested, you can look at how he does it. But for us, what I'm going to look at is a delta distributed distribution or a delta distributed um, doubling times. So it's possible to solve for the normalization. Arbitrarily, but they, it's a lot of work. Well, not a lot, but it's work. All right. So for us, it is. It will be sufficient to uh, consider uh, delta distributed doubling times. or division times. So this F uh, tau prime is going to just be a delta distribution, a direct delta distribution around some macroscopic or, or fixed doubling time tau. All right, where this... Uh, So this will then give us that phi A phi A is going to be phi at zero uh, E <coughs> negative lambda A or zero. So this is for A between zero and tau and this is otherwise. if I did that right. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, which part? This part? Yes. Okay, so suppose now we put a delta function. Mm -hmm. So the delta function is zero uh, except for one point. And then if we integrate across that point, then we get one. And so if A is above tau, mm -hmm. this delta function will be... Uh, over here in the interval. We'll miss it. We won't integrate across it. Does that make sense? But then if the um, A is going to be less than tau, then we'll have a delta function that we'll integrate over, and we'll get 1. And so this thing is either going to be 1 or 0, depending if A is uh, greater or less than tau. Okay, let me write that up, and then let's, let's uh, 
talk about it for one more second, i.e., we have that this integral, delta t prime minus tau dt prime, is equal to uh, 1 if a is less than tau, and 0 if a is greater than tau. And, I mean, depending on your definition <laughs> of how to integrate the delta function, you could put an equal to sign on the top one or the bottom. But let's, I'll just leave it. Unless it drives you crazy, and in which case we can decide how, what we want to do with it. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So it's not, it's not well defined whether, when I integrate um, you know, with this tau right at one of the boundaries, is what I'm saying. So I'm going to ignore the boundary. Let me pause now. Is that distribution, is this, is this function now sensible? Given this definition for the delta function? It's okay? Any concerns? Good. Okay. All right. So now we'll look at the normalization, and then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be able to plot this guy, and then we'll be done. So after normalization, i.e. enforcing this condition that the integral from 0 to infinity of phi a dA is equal to 1, we end up with the following solution for phi 0. We get phi of a is equal to, and you can do this if you like, or you can take my word for it, e negative lambda a all right, so long as a is less than tau, but I'm going to, I'm going to make one more change in a second. But then we know that, especially, I mean, in this case where the tau is, is a macroscopic doubling time, that that means that we're just rewriting the, the natural base, E, in a base 2, if you like. And so this lambda, which is my exponential growth rate, is related to tau, which is my base 2 doubling rate, by the natural logarithm of 2. So this thing, let me write one more thing, which is that lambda is equal to long 2 over tau. Now, if we had a general distribution for the doubling times, that wouldn't be true. And so that's another hassle about dealing with generalized uh, distributions for the doubling time. But for delta distributed, that's by definition true. Okay? This is the time it takes me to increment by a factor of 2. This is the time it takes me to increment by a factor of 2.7, whatever, blah, blah. All right. And so then I end up with... Let me write one more line and let's talk about it. 2 ln 2 divided by tau, 2 minus a over tau for a up to tau. All right. And so let me pause first of all. Is that okay? Does it mix with the definitions that we've been using so far? Is Basically, my point. Does anybody feel there's a contradiction? No. Okay. And so, normally, or often, often we normalize, or often we we use a relative age. Say a hat, which I'm going to uh, divide by tau. In which case, this distribution becomes the following. And I do this just because I want to be able to write it in a very compact way. So then we get phi of a hat is going to be equal to 2 ln 2 of uh, 2 raised to the negative a hat for a hat going between 0 and 1. 
All right. Now my question is, okay, let me pause. There's, there's been a lot of algebra hidden underneath the, the sink here. But this is the, this in the end is what I wanted to get at today. And I wanted to get at this because uh, for two reasons. Well, for one main reason is because when we look at the experiments um, that were done on, on trying to synchronize cells, this distribution is going to show up. And it's important that we you know, see where it came from, I think. All right, but before that, what does this distribution look like? This is only for this f of tau prime equal to t minus d, t prime. You, you will need to, that's part of the problem with the general distribution is that not only do you need to normalize, you also need to relate the empirical doubling time to this distribution, to some moment of that distribution. Does that make sense? And so that derivation, I'll, I'll post that pa paper and you can look through it. So it's not part of the papers that I have on the website right now, but I'll make it part of that web, those papers. Do you know what I mean? If you're interested in the general derivation, I'll, pu I'll put it up on the website for this, for this part. It's okay? So if you are interested in a more general argument, I'll make that available to you. All right, let me pause, though. Any questions? It's okay. All right, what's this uh, distribution uh, look like then? Yeah, there is a question. The normalization or the factor should be lambda over one. No, no, the in the third. This guy? Minus E to minus. Yes, 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 yes. Lambda. Minus oh wait, wait, wait. No, because it's in the basement. Uh you, no, you're right. Negative lambda tap. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, very nice. Okay, wh what does this uh function look like? Yeah, perfect. It just looks like this. And so this thing is 2 long 2, and this thing is long 2. <coughs> and so the relative abundance of babies is twice as much as, uh, as their mothers, if you like. Or not, that's not quite right. They're twice as much as those just about to have babies. Or just about to divide. All right. Okay. Let me pause. Any questions about any of these? Okay. All right. So this distribution is where we're going to start. Now, I, I don't know when this one ends. Does this one end? What's the time that these things end at? 11, 10? Oh, okay, okay. All right. So maybe I'll say, ah, you know what? This is a good place to stop. Uh, so next, next time, so that will be tomorrow at 11, we'll, uh, we'll start with this distribution. And so the genius of a guy named Helmstetter is that he's going to come up with an apparatus that samples, as a function of time, tiny strips from this distribution. And so essentially, he has a time series of synchronized cells. And it took him 10 years to come up with this idea. And... Um, Maybe I'll give you, all right, I'll give you just one sort of, um, what do you call it, foreshadowing? That he imagined himself lying in bed and a bunch of chickens on his ceiling dropping eggs on his head. And that was the sort of the epiphany for him. So with that in mind, imagine how you would sample this distribution. And we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. But let me pause again. Any questions about this? So the details are in the lecture notes and in the course notes. And as I say, I'll make the more general derivation available through the website. It's okay? All right. Okay. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Then.